Uh, we are now on sort of uh, number three of, of these seminars. We, we did one uh, last year on vermouth and bitters, and then we did one uh, towards the end of last year, which we did uh, uh, what we called uh, the new world of whiskies. Uh, so that was basically all whiskies, with the exception really of bourbon and, and scotch. And then we thought, gosh, what are we going to do next? Um, we need to come up with something that's going to be interesting and engaging and isn't just a vodka seminar or a gin seminar. So what can we do that isn't also a masterclass and also gives you guys an opportunity to taste a number of different spirits? And one of us, I can't even remember if it was me or someone else, came up with a great idea of saying, why don't we pick a region? And we went, that's a great idea. Um, and we thought, well, Central and South America has got a lot of diversity but more importantly, it's got two categories within it which are very interesting for people in our industry uh, and also the sort of the wider industry as well. So obviously, from our point of view, agave spirits, mezcal uh, in particular, which is a very on-trend uh, spirit, and also cachaca, which with the World Cup just gone and the Olympics next year is also a very current spirit to talk about as well. And I get to talk about peace guys, which is good. Uh, and uh, rum, which is also something else I'd like to talk about. So that's kind of it. Um, as I said, I'm going to rattle for a presentation. Um, if you've registered, <clears throat> we should have your email address. We will send you the presentation. Um, if you haven't put your email address upstairs, feel free to come and write it down, and I will send you the presentation uh, so you can read it, I guess, and look at the pictures and try and remember what I said. Uh, um, and the other thing I'll talk about right at the end. So there you go. Um, so, <coughs> what we're going to do here, if you're not aware, Central and South America. Um, this is a timeline. I generally do stuff in timelines because most people in the hospitality industry, we like stuff that sort of we can relate to a time, whether it's 1862 or if it's 1803 or whatever it happens to be. We like, we like dates. So I was start with a timeline. I won't necessarily follow this. I have to find out. Fifteen hundreds, sugar cane distilled in Brazil. We all know that in fourteen ninety two, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and went to Cuba uh, and Dominican Republic and places like that and planted sugar cane. Uh, we also know not long after uh, the Portuguese came and uh, planted sugar cane in, in Brazil. Once the Spanish had finished uh, um, planting sugarcane everywhere, they made their way into Mexico, and somebody, maybe the Spanish, maybe people before, no one's entirely sure, started to distill mezcal brandy about 1500, admittedly towards the end of the 1500s, I, I, I hate to point out. In the 1600s, pisco or, or brandy was distilled in the vice royalty of Peru. We'll talk about that a bit more. In the 1800s, rum was first produced in Venezuela. 1940s, in Guatemala, they introduced quite sophisticated distilling processes. Right about 1900, Colombia thought, oh, actually, we've got a lot of sugar cane, we'll start making rum too. And, and one of my particular favourite on the internet is in the noughties, the Colombians started making gin, which is great. Because <laughs> it's the last place you'd ever expect anyone to make gin. But that's it. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, are probably not aware that the Philippines is the largest producer of gin in the world. You aware of that? There you go. You can take that little nugget home with you. The largest producer and consumer of gin in the world is the Philippines. Way, way more than anyone else. Certainly way more than Colombia. Um, but he's upstairs, Dictador. So, uh, again, he's got his rum, he's got his gin. Have a try. Okay, so as I said, that's the timeline, I don't necessarily follow it. I will start with Mexico, though. Uh, I'll start with Mexico for a number of reasons. One, it's a lovely place, uh, and, it, and it, it looks like it in photos, uh, which is one of the other reasons. Uh, and also, agave spirits come from Mexico, and specifically mezcal, and obviously tequila as well. So, we'll talk about it uh, to start with. Um, I'll, I'll go back to these pictures, but in case you're not aware, that's what agave is. Now, this is where it gets a bit confusing, um, and, and the, the, there's been a bit of a sort of rebalancing of the category uh, in the last sort of sort of five years or so. 
So what we're going to talk about is agave spirits, so spirits which are distilled from the agave plant, and the category is known as mezcal. So that is the overall category, like brandy is our spirit. Hello guys, grab a seat. Um, spirits, uh, um, brandy is, is spirit distilled from grapes, mezcal is spirit distilled from agave. Okay, so, so um, that'll be sort of slightly complicated in a bit, but it's not too... So agave is our raw ingredient. What we do know, the first alcoholic beverage made from the agave was pulque. And pulque is essentially that. It is fermented wine from the agave. This was made way, way before uh, the Spanish arrived in Mexico and was used very much for uh, religious ceremonies, etc., etc., but also drunk uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a medicine uh, amongst other things. When the Spanish first arrived, um, the first thing they did, like most European nations when they first arrived in the country that they were colonising, was they banned everything that was produced locally, uh, because what they wanted to do was you to buy their imported spirit, notably brandy. So it was illegal to distill uh, uh, in uh, Mexico. The idea was you bought brandy from, from the Spanish. Eventually they realised that actually it was very expensive to bring it over from Spain, uh, and for various other reasons as well. So they started to distill the pulque. And this is where we get what's called mezcal wine. So as I talked about, the overall category. And we do know that within that, we have some subcategories. The most famous one is tequila. Tequila produced in five states, and most notably Jalisco, or Jalisco, made from a minimum of 51% blue agave. Then we actually do have mezcal as a subcategory. Uh, noticeable in some brands in countries around the world from having a worm in it. Because a lot of people think tequila has the worm, so at least you can say, well, actually, it's mezcal that normally has the worm. It's worth pointing out, there's a lot of mezcals upstairs that do not have worms in it. Okay. Sotol. Sotol is a agave from the state of Chihuahua, hence the little dog. Um, this is my favourite slide at the moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and then two others, Brasilla and Bacanora. Two other agave spirits. As far as I know, these are not exported outside of Mexico yet. So you can't buy them in the US, you certainly can't buy them in the UK. So we'll let, let's see where we are uh, in, a, in a few years of those. Um, I'll talk a bit about those anyway as, as, as uh, we go further into the presentation. So agave is the more ingredient. Polka is the fermented beverage, and then mezcal is the uh, distilled spirit, and then subcategories with that. Uh, here you go, this is a picture of Mexico. So, mezcals are produced, mezcal, the, the category is distilled all over Mexico. Sonara, Chihuahua, famously Jalisco, Oaxaca, uh, all over the place. So, it's a very sort of diverse uh, production. And it will change from, from, from some state to state. Now, this is where I said it gets a bit confusing. The category definition of a of mezcal is spirit distilled from fermented Mexican agave, which is also known as in Spanish the maguey, or in America the century plant. The century plant really uh, relates to the, the length of time it grows. In the native Mexican Language, mezcal, means oven-cooked agave. Okay. So this is where, as I said, it gets slightly confusing. So we're going to talk specifically really about this sort of subcategory of mezcal. Oaxaca, the state, is the, is the state that produces about 95% of all mezcal. Around about 30 different agaves can be used, but mostly an agave called espadin. And unlike tequila, as you're fully aware, tequila is a, is a big category. A lot of very big, famous brands have been established for a very long time, you know, uh, sort of late 1700s, early 1800s. It's a commercial enterprise nowadays. If you go to Mexico, you go to the agave fields around Jalisco, the agaves are lined up in beautiful rows. If you go to Oaxaca, it's a lot more uh, sort of wild and, and, and an un uncultivated uh, 
uh, process. So the, the, the agave will grow in rocky outcrops, etc. It's not the same sort of uh, sort of cultivation and, 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 and uh, process that you have certainly with tequila, for the simple reason that it's not the same commercial enterprise in most cases. This is the big difference. Number one, as I say, tequila is a minimum 51% blue agave. Tequila, or the agaves used in tequila, the blue agave specifically, are cooked usually in either hornos, which is a clay oven, or in a big autoclave, which is a big steam oven. And the appropriate word there, if you like, is steam. Because what we're going to do is we're going to steam the agaves for a period of time. If it's an autoclave, it's a quick process. It takes about 12, 24 hours at most. If it's an hornos, an autoclave, it's a longer process just because of the way it take, the time it takes to heat these things up. The, the, the result is the agave pretty much just collapses inside and you end up with all the carbohydrate inside turning into a beautiful aqua mele, a honey water. And if any of you, I'm sure most of you have got it in your bar or certainly come across it, which is uh, agave nectar, uh, which we use for Tommy's margaritas and other things. That's essentially the, the, the raw ingredient. Very, very typical flavour is the agave. So it tastes... I, I describe agave uh, as tasting quite green, so it's got that sort of herbaceous, citrusy note, uh, particularly if it's uh, agaves used for tequila process. But for cooking, they retain the flavour of the agave. This is the big difference in 99.9% of cases. With mezcal, we build a we, we, they dig a big pit in the, in the ground, bless it. We generally line that with volcanic uh, rock and we heat up stones on fires until they're red hot. We put them at the bottom and then we put the agaves on the top and then we cover that with, uh, mes uh, with agave fibre, etc., etc., to, to create basically a lid and a, and a seal. And then we allow them to cook and they cook very slowly, as you can imagine, if you put a uh, we often use a, a potatoes as an example. If you put a potato in, in the oven on a very low temperature for three days, as opposed to stick it in a microwave for 20 seconds, you're going to get a much, much different uh, result. So you end up primarily with a slow-cooked agave, which has a very distinctive, hopefully I'll get the right way, smoking flavour. And that really is how we can distinguish mezcals from tequila particularly. Uh, if you haven't tried a mezcal before, go and try them upstairs. And, and I very often describe mezcal, if people say, what's mezcal taste like? Well, it's like an island malt whiskey. It's got that really lovely smoke note to it. Which sometimes can be a bit of an acquired taste, but trust me, it's not a taste that takes long to acquire. You know, within about 20 seconds, you're like, gosh, I've got to have a bit more of this. This is quite an amazing liquid. It gives it um, sort of a huge amount of, 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 of variety. Uh, a couple of other things that's worth noting as well. Um, generally, it's distilled twice in alambics in pot stills, so you retain a lot of that smoke. A lot of tequilas often distilled in continuous stills as well now. So you're still retaining the flavour of the agave. Uh, they distilled to a reasonably low ABV you want to retain the flavour of, of the raw ingredient. And this final thing here, governed by what's called Comacan, which is, uh, in, in tequila we have the CRT, which is the regulatory body of tequila. They set the regulations and rules, make sure everyone's doing what they're supposed to. Comacan is what we have for Mezcan. And although it was around before then, it wasn't really fully operational until 2005, so less than 10 years ago. Now, for some of you who've been in this industry less than 10 years, you might remember seeing one brand of Mezcal, uh, which was named after a well-known um, uh, Aztec uh, king. I will leave it at that. Um, that was the only brand, uh, certainly when I started bartending, which is certainly longer than 10 years ago. These guys came along... Their role was to make sure that you're going to get a decent regulated uh, spirit, but more importantly, to help 
promote, uh, promote mezcals as well. So suddenly you went from having that one I talked about with the worm in to suddenly artisanal ones to the point now where you can go upstairs. I don't know. I think we've got about 30 or 40 brands upstairs. You know, five years ago, we probably would have had a tenth of that. And this is one of the reasons. So these guys make sure you're getting a good quality liquid. Um, to be honest, their job isn't actually about quality. It's not about regulation. But more importantly, it's about promoting the category as well. Which is why I always have a picture of a worm there. Because very often people say, particularly when you're talking to people, unlike us who have a vague knowledge, go, oh, tequila, that's the one with the worm in it. So oh, actually, it's not. Tequila doesn't have a worm. Mezcal sometimes have a worm. Uh, as you know, the worm is not a worm per se. It's a, it's a larvae that grows on the agave. How it ended up in there? Well, cynical people like me um, think it was some marketing guy sitting down in probably New York City one day with a bunch of people from Mexico saying, how do we sell as much of our liquid as they do of tequila? And he said, you need a gimmick. And they go, oh. I said, well... Can you think of something? Oh, well, there's a worm, sort of, that grows. Well, well let's put one in the bottle. And let's, let's, make, let's kind of tell people that if you eat the worm, something magical will happen to you. Um, you know what? You can buy those worms, uh, and I've eaten them, and nothing magical happens to you. Uh, you freak out a lot of people, uh, particularly if you do it you know, on the bus or something, and you're sitting there eating uh, bugs. Uh, but it's, it's quite good fun, try it. Uh, the point being... Is it cynical? Is it a marketing ploy? Might be. However, it's worth noting that one of the other reasons it's in there is if the alcohol is of a reasonably high alcohol, of the, sorry, the spirit is a reasonably high alcohol content, it will preserve the worm, and the worm will stay intact. So you could be guaranteed, if you saw something that said 40% alcohol and the worm is disintegrated, it might only be 15% alcohol, not enough to preserve the worm. So on one hand, cynical people like me, or fresh-faced, positive people like you who believe it's not about marketing, keep that. It's not all about marketing. So anyway, mezcal, primarily. Sometimes has a worm. A lot of them don't upstairs. You'll see a lot of them don't have a worm, but it seems to be working for some people. So I talked about these uh, other spirits. Brasilia, uh, produced in Jalisco, where they make tequila, probably before. So it would have been made the same way the Mezcal, Underground, Dummies, etc. But actually it was Jose Cuervo who got the licence from the, from the Spanish royal family to start distilling. And then it was the Salsa family who got the licence to export. So they were kind of a little bit ahead of the game. It was unregulated until 2002. It's probably made about 500 years before then. But you could do what you want. You know, it was an unregulated spirit. It was basically moonshine. And they used electric wheeler agave, so the no blue agave. As I said, as far as I'm aware, there isn't anyone who sells that's outside of uh, Mexico yet. Uh, Bacanora is produced by uh, Sonora, which is up uh, in the north of the country. It was illegal, so this was proper moonshine, bootlegging <coughs> liquid, up until 1992. <coughs> and it's made from the Pacific or agave, and made in the same way as mezcal, so that oven cooks, uh, double distillation, and aged. Just one thing on the aging. They pretty much follow the same uh, tequila, blanco, avocado, um, reposado, uh, and uh, añejo. And then finally, sotol from, uh, from the state of Chihuahua. And it's made from the long growing 15 years uh, sotol plant, so it's named after this plant. Um, the difference as well between sotol, the plant, and other agaves is agave grows once. So it's, 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 it's an annual, so it only grows once, and once it's grown, you cook it, you use it for tequila or medical, it doesn't grow again. Unlike the which is perennial, it will grow again year after year. But it takes a long time. I often say to people, specifically about tequila, everyone in this country and every part of the world has an issue with tequila. I think it's down to two things. A, it's taste, it's distinctive, and secondly, when people drink it, which is generally the last thing they drink before they go to bed. Um, and very often it's the first thing they remember when they wake up feeling wretched the following morning. It's got a bit of a, uh, an image problem. And I often, and people think, oh, tequila, it's rubbish, it's really, it's, you know, it's cactus juice, it's all that nonsense. And I say to them, it takes 10 years to grow an agave. 
This is, this is an investment people are making. You get two crops of sugar cane a year, you can grow lots of corn, you can grow you know, loads of wheat and make vodka. It takes 10 years to grow an agave. So it really is a, this is an investment from these guys over in Mexico. So show a bit more respect is kind of what I'm saying to people. Um, as I said, made by mezcal, so they all follow underground cooking uh, more than uh, the steaming that you would get with tequila. So that's agave spirit. So uh, it's a growing category. Uh, certainly uh, a mezcal as well, and tequila in general. Um, it's, it's a growing category. And it tastes great. So it is Okay. Um, quick question. Does anyone know what next week is? It's kind of related to what's happening. It's, it's Pisco Sour Week next week. Woo! Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm taking a week's holiday. Um, it's a big partying period. The water things that everybody understood. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Water, so yeah, it's a big, it's a big holiday. It's a big festival out there. Yeah, they celebrate. It's a, it's a big celebration. Yeah. Um, slightly smaller uh, over here, but it's worth noting in London, particularly in other parts of the country, we now have a fair few Peruvian and Chilean restaurants. Uh, how many people here have had a pisco sour? Huh? A few of you. I assume the rest of you haven't. Can all the people who've had a piece go sour tell the other people just how great they are? Yeah, they are, aren't they? They're amazing. Seriously, you know. Just, just next week, just go to one of these places and just drink piece go sour because they're amazing. Have a piece go punch whilst you're there as well. It's all uh, exceptionally good too. Now, piece go is a uh, is a spirit that is made from grapes, so it's a brandy. So a brandy is a spirit made from grapes. Like cognac, uh, cognac, and oh, sorry, French brandies. Let, let me start again. French brandies are uh, Armagnac, cognac specifically. What they tend to use are grapes that have low flavour, but have long aging potential. Because with a cognac and with an Armagnac, you're going to go for something that's going to age gracefully over ten or fifteen or longer years. Because what you're going to try and produce is, 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 a, is a liquid or a spirit that is a combination of, of the raw ingredient, the grape, but more importantly something that takes a lot of influence from the outside, from, from, from the air, and also how that air interacts with the oak and therefore interacts with the spirit. Which makes it different from Pisco. Because what Pisco does is kind of the opposite of that. They take aromatic grapes, so grapes that start with a lot of flavour, they distill them to a reasonably low ABV to retain that flavour, and then they don't go for a long age. But what they tend to do is, is a short age. But it's worth noting, although they both share the same sort of commonality in terms of the grape varieties they use, and, and some, uh, to some degree the aromatic style of the spirit, they're both made in, in, in a significantly different way. And we've got both countries represented upstairs, so please go and try them, because they are different, and it's worth um, tasting one. Now, I mentioned before the Viceroyalty of Peru. Uh, Viceroyalty of Peru was essentially what the Spanish called that big old chunk of Central America. So it included Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, Chile. So it was a big old chunk of the world. They all produced brandy. Uh, and most of it, at some point, made its way through the port of Pisco, which is in Peru. And they were all kind of called Pisco, uh, as, a, as a sort of, a, you know, like we all call, you know, bourbon is whiskey. Uh, and you know, and, and Scotch is, is is whiskey too. So it was just a casual term for for spirit that was was made from grapes in that part of the world. But it generally all came from the port of Pisa, which led to an interesting uh, position where we are now, which is the town of Pisco is in Peru. They say it's ours. Pisco is a spirit that is Peruvian. The Chileans, on the other hand, say, well, actually, it's a spirit that is produced in this part of the world. So actually, it's, it's almost saying like, you know, Scotch whiskey is only Scottish, but we know that whiskey is from other parts of the world as well. So there's a, a debate going on at the moment of whether, um, uh, you know, whether, whether it'll ever end up being uh, uh, Peruvian or Chilean, we'll, we'll probably, probably never find out. Just to really complicate things, there is Pisco, which is made in, in Portugal as well, just to really make things really hard for the guys in Central America. So, we'll see, but there's always an argument about names, and, and that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, as I said, they make different spirits, uh, fundamentally. Uh, here you go, uh, Peru, they're actually here. Um, 
How many of you have Chilean wines on your wine list at work? Excellent. How many of you have Peruvian wines? Yeah. That kind of says a lot. To give you an idea, um, Chile produces about 100 million litres of Pisco a year. Peru produces about 8 million litres. Why? Well, because Chile has got a much, much bigger wine uh, industry. Which is why um, we've got more Pisco produced, we've got a lot more wines to distill. Back to uh, this. So, as I said, um, it's worth bearing in mind as well that um, Peru kind of suffered from a couple of things. Um, the Spanish really encouraged the growth of sugarcane in Central America uh, to export back to Europe. Uh, there's a lot of money in sugar. Uh, and subsequently, there was a lot of byproduct from sugar production, which is molasses, which we make into rum. So people stopped drinking pisco and started drinking rum because it was encouraged by the Europeans. So that was kind of didn't help. Um, and subsequently, Peru, a lot of Peruvian uh, wine growing, they dug them all up into plant of sugar cane instead. So it kind of started. Chile, because I had a very established uh, wine industry, was always uh, fairly, um, fairly secure. Anyway, so here we've got a difference of how we made them. So they'll all use similar grapes, uh, these aromatic grapes as they know. Uh, Muscat, Torrental, Pedro Jimenez in Chile, please, up to about 11. They were to still it in pots, uh, in pot stills, up to no more than 73%, which is about what we would distill Scotch whiskey and cognac to. However, it tends to be lower, around about 65%. They will mature it in oak or indigenous woods for about 60 days, so uh, two months, give or take. They'll dilute it before bottling because they di the dilution will allow us to categorise it. So it's categorised on how strong the liquid is. So if it's a traditional uh, pisco, Chilean pisco, is 30, 30 to 35% ABV, so quite low if we think vodka's 40 and gin's about 40. Uh, Reservado, 40%, and then finally Grand Pisco is about 43%, certainly no less than 43%. And it's worth noting as well, just in this case, 43% is what the minimum ABV for a lot of imported spirits is to pass the world. So you can't import spirits into a lot of the world below 43%. So it's kind of getting around that importation uh, regulation. Peru, as I say, slightly different production again. Um, this will have more of that sort of cognac note to it as well, even though you'll get a lot of ane, um, sort of white piscos or slightly coloured piscos, you'll get some influence from Peru. Uh, Peru's very, uh, very different as well. They use about eight uh, quebranta, muscat again, so you've got this aromatic grape. Distilled in pots again to a lower ABV. It's bottled at distillation strength, so you know you're talking something that's distilled to around about 45 to 55 percent ABV tops. It retains a lot of flavour. Now rest it for three months. It's rested. It's not aged. It's rested. It will go into a massive container, generally concrete, stainless steel, or wood that won't impart any flavour. And the idea being is they don't want influence from anything else. No sugars, no colourings, no other flavours added at all, and certainly no influence from, from wood. So what you're drinking with Peruvian Pisco is something that's very pure. And they don't categorise like this. How they categorise is, 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 is what their natural, what, what their ingredients are. So Puro, which is the most common uh, Peruvian style of Pisco enjoyed at home, is one great variety, Puro. So, um, Muscat or uh, <coughs> tends to be Quebranto is the most, the most common one. Uh, Acolado, which is a blend, so a blend of different grapes. And then finally, in the best vintage years, they'll do what's called a Mosto Verde. And this is something that has had a, the fermentation stopped before all the sugars converted. So it'll be slightly sweeter and a little bit more aromatic because you've got the, the flavour of the sugar in there, the flavour of the, the sweeter compounds in there as well. So try them. You know, they are different, uh, even though you think they're the same. And then next week, as I said, go and drink these house because they are amazing. They will change your world. Uh, and you will go and buy Pisco just because of that. Uh, as I said, there was a lot of brandy produced uh, throughout the, the, the world at that point, or that part of the world, and it all generally came under the name of Pisco. 
Okay. Right. Uh, Rums of Central America. Pisco. Everyone was growing sugar cane. There's a lot of sugar cane growing in South America. Sorry, Central and South America. These are the main countries, even though there are more. Venezuela, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Colombia, Mexico, Panama. They generally share the same style. Um, the style tends to be Spanish. Uh, when, when I describe rum to people, we describe it very often as, as uh, characterised by the country... I'm sorry, characterised by the language that they speak in the country. So, British rums. So, Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, uh, those islands, they speak English. They produce molasses-based, uh, quite sort of hot, still, medium-bodied rums. Generally. In the islands where they speak French, Martinique, Guadalupe, they produce uh, rum agricoles, which are rums that are produced from sugar cane, not the molasses. And then we have rums where they speak Spanish. So these would be Latin American uh, countries. So things Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, even though most of them in Puerto Rico speak American, um, Mexico, and all through Central America. They produce rums of that style. They tend to be light and mixable. And in a lot of cases, the majority are aged. They're aged in wooden barrels and sometimes filtered through charcoal to give a white rum. But the majority have spent a minimum period in, in an oak barrel. So we say very often they're of that Spanish style. Why? Well, Spain basically ran Central America, so it can't make sense that they taught people how to distill the way they distilled it. So there are some things that are different within them. Most notably, some will use what's called virgin sugar cane honey. Um, molasses, as I'm sure you know, which is where a lot of rums are made, is a byproduct of sugar production. You make sugar, you boil it, you boil it, you stick it in the centrifuge, you get beautiful granulated white sugar at one end and you get a thick black sticky treacle at the other. That's molasses. It's got about sugar content 40, 40 to 50% generally. South Central America, some other brands will use. Essentially, molasses is only, it's not, not used or not destined to be made into sugar. It's destined to be made into rum, but unlike rum agricole, which uses sugarcane juice, this has been boiled and slightly evaporated. The advantage of that is it starts to take out some of the impurities, so the more you boil it, the purer it becomes. So you're starting to lose some of those impurities you don't want. So there are rums, uh, as an example, Diplomatico, as an example, is, is, is a rum that uses virgin sugarcane. You notice when you taste it, it's sweet, a honey-styled rum. So it's filtered to take the bits out and then partially evaporated, just partially boiled. Distillation, well, that copies the Spanish style. So pots or columns, it's the 21st century, you know, we make different styles. The important thing that they do, like all rum producers, they make lots of different types of rum. High strength, low flavour, low flavour, high strength, lots of different marks, which they'll then blend together to create their style of rum. So that's very common. But it's not so common, certainly in British and, and French islands, in fact it's pretty much unheard of in those uh, rums, is using a Solera system. Solera systems is what we use to make sherry. And as you know, sherry is Spanish. So, the process is exactly the same. When we make sherry, just as we're making rum, you have a, a series of, of barrels, one above the other. What will happen is the new spirit will go into the top uh, barrel, and when you come to bottle it, you always take from the bottom row. The idea being that, you can say, generally speaking, no more than 50% is ever uh, taken from the barrels, so there's always a minimum of 50% in there. 50% comes out here, you top up from above, you top up from above, you top up from above. So immediately, all new spirit is introduced to older, maturing spirit as you go down the, the system. Down to there. And the idea being, you get what's called educated rum. So you get integrated, blended rum quite quickly. You don't have a specific age, you can't say this rum is 12 years old because it's an average age, it's in a, it's in a Solera. You can say the Solera is 28 years old, the oldest barrel is 28, the oldest rum 
in the barrel, but you can't say it's a determined age because you've got young spirit going on top. The majority of them, Zacapa is, is, is a good example of a Solarid rum, so they're upstairs as well. Um, have, a, have a try that, I haven't tried before. So that's unique as well in the area. So Solaris, version sugar cane, distillation techniques will vary. Some, as I said before, won't use a Solera, they'll just be matured the same way. They generally use oak uh, imported from America. Okay. Oh, regulations. <laughs> It's quite tricky to find out regulations of, of, of South Central, Central American spirits. Uh, just as a rule, uh, the, the main definition of rum, or the main regulation of rum is rum must taste like rum. There you go. That's a pre that, that was out for a wide definition. What are you going to do? How you made rum? Excellent. How do you make rum? Well, it's got to taste like rum. Um, however, countries will have different regulations. Venezuela and Panama, a minimum of two years in oak. Uh, Mexico, a minimum of eight months. And then finally, Venice and Cumbria, minimum 40% ABV. It will vary uh, from other countries. Not massively regulated. Okay, and lastly, but by no means leastly, we're going to talk about Brazil. We talked about rum from Central America. Now we're going to talk about sugarcane spirit from South America. Cachaça is not rum. There's, reason, there's a couple of reasons why it's not rum. Uh, number one, well, sugarcane distillate, first and foremost. Um, rum must show the characteristics of rum, which is different to cachaça. Cachaça is a unique flavour, there's no question. You will never mix up cachaça and Bacardi. Absolutely no way would you be able to go, actually, I'm not sure which one's which. You know, rum really does taste like rum. Cachaça really tastes like cachaça. Uh, that's Brazil, it's a big country, as you're probably aware. That's sugarcane and that's Costa. I like it. So, just a couple of little uh, uh, snippets on cachaça. The definition is a Brazilian liquor made from sugar cane. Firstly, <laughs> it's the fourth largest global spirit category. Uh, it might be third today, it might be fourth. Uh, it changes, depending on who you read, it changes. Um, it's big. Um, the biggest is Sochu, uh, which is South Korean. Uh, second to Baiju, which is Chinese. Vodka probably heard of that. Now that's kind of big too. And then finally we've got cachaça. Uh, vodka and cachaça kind of swap places. Uh, uh, um, fairly uh, fairly 1.7 billion litres a year they produce. That's a lot. But they, they actually export less than 1%. So they keep it. They drink it. That's what we love about it. We make whiskey in Scotland. We sell it. We get rid of it. We sell it to China. We sell it to America. We don't keep it because we, 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 you know, I don't know why. Actually, we sell it. We make a lot of money from it. You know, cachaça. Like we just keep this. This is too good to share. They were the first commercial sugarcane producer in the world, and they are the largest sugarcane producer in the world as it stands at the moment. In fact, that probably won't change. The majority of rum that you will drink from the Caribbean will be made with Brazilian uh, sugarcane because they've got a lot of it. And unfortunately, the Caribbean has mostly been flattened by hurricanes over the last sort of 100 or 200 years and they don't grow as much cane as they can. Well, they, 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 sh they would have able to do So, a little bit of uh, history. Sugarcane introduced from Madeira in the 1500s. The Madeira was a Portuguese island. Brazil, Portuguese colony. You kind of see where they're going with that. 1500s, early 1500s, Aguardiente, fire water. What was first produced? We know. You're shaking your head. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, about almost a hundred years before rum was first made. We know that rum was first made on uh, the island of Barbados in 1603. We, someone wrote that down. So we're fairly, we're pretty certain now that. Brazil created sugarcane spirit anyway, whether we call it rum or not. We said it wasn't called cachaça at that point, it was a grindy end. 1610, someone actually wrote it down. Um, uh, and then we have been drinking cachaça today, we had a good time, we went to the beach. Um, so we basically get two styles you get industrial cachaça, mostly made around Sao Paulo, big, big city, lots of people, they just drink a lot of cachaça. But then you get these smaller, what we call artisanal brands, there's a few upstairs, that will be produced all over the country because they meant to throw sugar cane over the country. It's worth pointing out, actually, I forgot to put this in. 95% of that 1.7 billion litres of cachaça is made 
by five brands. So that's uh, Pirasinga, Kashasa 51, Pichu, uh, Yipkoka, I don't know how you pronounce it, but that's fairly close. So within five brands. So there's a lot that is used uh, uh, primarily for those kinds. Caipirinha, uh, National Drink of Brazil, not created by a bartender or, or a magazine, but actually created probably by people in the field who were harvesting sugarcane. This is what they did. It predates all other sour drinks by at least 100, maybe more, maybe 200 years. So we're fairly certain. Even when we talk about the daiquiri and the mojito, certainly we're fairly confident that the mojito, in its original form of the mint, uh, the aguardiente, uh, and the sugar, and the, and the lime, was a cachaca drink. It wasn't a rum drink. Um, so predates mo well, all sour drinks by a long, long way. And I like to talk about this as well. Uh, the other big drink of, of, of Brazil, uh, of, uh, the cheese of uh, cachaça, is called Betida. Um, and Betida, unlike uh, cachaça, is um, easier to make because it doesn't require any muddling. You need a blender. Um, it's great to plonk everything, switch the blender off and go out. This is fresh fruit. It's essentially just cachaça, some sugar, some fresh fruit, uh, or coconut, or condensed milk, or various things. It's a very, very lovely drink. Um, you need a blender. Um, but try it, uh, and, and it's a lot less hassle and less likely to cut fingers uh, than you are if you're making gyperinias. Okay, so production. Um, right. Cachaca is not rum for two reasons. One, the Brazilians don't want it to be called rum because it's, 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 it's a spirit of, of it's, it's Brazilian, it's their, it's their thing. They want it to be called cachaça. They want everyone around the world to recognise cachaça as a Brazilian product, first and foremost. It currently isn't, by the way, so that's worth noting. In America, it's classed as Brazilian rum, so they're not that keen on that. So it's not made wholly from sugarcane or a derivative. So rum is made wholly from the molasses, French rums, agricoles, are made wholly from sugarcane juice. It's not wholly made from sugarcane, so therefore it's not allowed to be called rum in that regard. I'll come to that in a sec. So, five different types of sugarcane that they will use. Um, harvested and milled within 36 hours. Sugarcane degrades really quickly. You don't want to chop it and leave it lying around for months on end like you would with other, uh, uh, other grains or, or things like that. You need to cut it, you need to harvest it, cut it, Press it, generally rehydrate it with a bit of water, ferment it and distill it quickly. The other thing they don't do as well, which they do in the large parts of the Caribbean that still have a sugarcane industry, is they don't burn the fields. So burning the fields caramelises the sugarcane, which is good for making rum because you start getting those nice caramelised flavours, but not good for cachaça. They'll filter it prior to fermentation to get the bits out, basically. It's pretty standard practice. And then this is the reason why it's not 100% molasses. Oh, sorry, 100% sugarcane. They will add what's called a leavening agent. And the leavening agent will, will um, be added to achieve a couple of different things. Number one, um, it will be like a cornmeal or another starch. Um, it will help the fermentation process uh, finish naturally. Um, it will stop the ferment uh, going bad. It will minimise the amount of bacteria that, that is allowed to grow within the fermentation, and it also gives the yeast something to, to feed on. So that's why it goes in there. It stops it being rough because it's not wholly sugar. Fermentation, up to three days, but usually about one day. You've got a lot of flavour there, so it's a reasonably fast fermentation. Distilled twice if we're going to make an alambic or, a, or what's called a traditional cachaça. Or column if we're going to make industrial, these big brands. Uh, they use a column because it's a commercial enterprise that want to make a lot. And then finally, we will mature it in imported oak. They don't grow oak in Brazil, so it will come from America or other parts of uh, Europe. Or indigenous oak from the rainforest, uh, cedar, uh, and uh, various other ones as well. Which is a way a lot of the cachaça industry is going because they want to, A, help conserve the rainforest, which is a good thing, but also at the same time they want to. Um, sort of uh, in, ensure that the, the cachaça is being made with wholly Brazilian uh, ingredients. And then finally, just some regulations. Distilled between 38 and 54%. So distilled, so no higher than 54%. That retains a lot of flavour 
if you think a lot of white rum, we distill to 94%. So we're taking out a lot of the flavour of the cane, but certainly 54% is really low. You're not allowed to bottle it more than 48% APV. You're allowed 6,500 parts per million of congeners. So these are the flavouring agents. That's why cachaca is such a flavoursome spirit. And that's why it's distilled to a reasonably low ABV as well. Uh, rum is about 2,500 to give you uh, an idea. You're allowed to about 6% of sweetness uh, to, to, to kind of smooth out that, that, those congeners, really, to, uh, to add a little bit of uh, mouthfeel, a little bit of, of, of density, uh, but more importantly, just to, to stop it just being so sort of fiery. And then finally, Asia Sash Kishasa even must contain a minimum of 51% uh, aged cachaca. So it doesn't have to be wholly aged, but a minimum of 51%. That's at least one year and has been matured in a barrel of 700 litres or less. And I believe that's it. So, thanks. Hopefully, you've got a little bit more uh, information to, to arm yourselves to go and ask some really difficult questions upstairs. Try some of those different brands we've talked about. So, great cachaca, alambic, cachaca being industrial, uh, all these things. Go and ask them some really tricky stuff. Uh, they're looking forward to it, trust me. Um, and then finally, one last thing. Even though I am, um, we're, we're a wholesaler, so we don't, we don't sell brands. Um, can I just point out, my good friend, a guy called Mark Ridgewell, um, has just written a really good book. Um, there's a company called Taste and Flavour. Uh, you might be familiar with people like Tom Estes and Ian Visnes.